This is a recording for chapter nine. How can we sustain biodiversity by looking at the ecosystems? So it's a little bit different from chapter eight where we looked at specific species. This we're looking at evaluations of entire ecosystems. The different ecosystems that we will discuss in this chapter include forests, rangeland, national parks, and aquatic ecosystems. And then we will follow up with discussions on how to protect, preserve, and restore or rehabilitate disturbed ecosystems. So we will begin with forests. What are the important economic and ecological services that forests provide? Forests remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and then store it in their biomass. And that happens through the process of photosynthesis. And this is a very important process that has removed great amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And this helps to stabilize the Earth's temperature and slow projected climate change. And this is a list of ecological services and economic services provided by forests, including storing atmosphere carbon, as I just mentioned, and providing habitats for a lot of wildlife, providing wood for fuel or lumber, or to make paper. Those are some examples. You could read the rest of the list. And there were two major types of forests based on their age and structure. And we have old growth forests. Those are uncut forests, or they are regenerated primary forests through ecological succession, but they have not been disturbed by human activities or natural disasters for at least the past 200 years. Second growth forests are a stand of trees resulting from secondary ecological succession that develops after trees in an area have been removed by human activities which includes clear cutting deforestation, which is removing the trees to use as timber or to clear the forest to use the land for farms, or by natural forces such as fires, hurricanes, or volcanic eruptions. This is an example of an old growth forest in Poland. And tree plantations are basically farms for trees. So these are commercial forests. And they have uniform species of trees generally. And they're uniform in age. And then they're all harvested, or at least the ones that are all the same age are all harvested around the same time when they become commercially valuable. So here you have the seedlings. This is the life cycle of a commercial forest. The seedlings, and then they grow larger. And at 25 years, they're all around the same height here. And then they're clear cut between 25 and 30 years, leaving you with almost no trees in that area. And then they're going to replant trees and the cycle begins. Now, this results in less biodiversity than a regular natural forest, because in this case, you are only planting one or maybe a couple of types of trees, species, 
and that removes all of the natural biodiversity that a regular forest would have, which would be lots of different types of plants and animals. So tree plantations have a lot lower biodiversity than the natural forest. And you have unsustainable logging methods that threaten forests. And logging is when you remove trees and then you use the wood for timber, for example, for construction purposes. So the first step in harvesting trees in a forest is that you build roads so that you can access the trees. And then you would need to cut them down and have access to bringing the logs back out of the forest. So here you have a highway that's being built through the forest. And then that leads to habitat fragmentation because you're separating these two parts of the forest now by a highway. You're losing biodiversity and eventually increase the amount of soil erosion that happens and sediment runoff when you have rain. The rainwater is going to pick up pieces of soil and that goes into the runoff. And here you have a more established logging industry and deforestation where you have an established highway and you have a lot of cleared land and now it's used for farming or rangeland for grazing and then here is an area where they are burning down more forests to make more land for farming And that is ultimately what happens, whereas here's the beginning of it, where you just built one highway to start removing trees. And then here, they're burning down a little bit of this area so that they could start making farmland there. And this, of course, removes a great deal of the biodiversity of the original forest. There are three main methods of cutting down trees to harvest them, and we call them selective cutting, clear cutting, and strip cutting. Selective cutting is when you have a small group of trees or single trees that are cut down within a forest. So you have a densely forested area and then you go through and every once in a while you cut down a couple of trees. That is selective cutting. And you see here the stream water is clear. And that is because you do not have a lot of soil erosion. So the river is not full of sediment. And that's because you're leaving most of the forest intact. Then you have clear cutting, which is basically removing all of the trees in an area. This is the most efficient method of logging, but it is the most destructive. And you have a lot of soil erosion because the whole area is exposed. And when it rains, all of the sediment and soil could be picked up and carried down the hill. And you can see this stream here is all muddy, full of sediment from the soil erosion. And there's a tremendous loss of biodiversity. And then this could lead to the land collapsing into landslides, where big chunks of the land just collapse down the hill. And this is a photo of the of a clear cut area and then these trees are left here but the rest of the area has been clear cut this is an aerial view showing a clear cut forested area 
in Washington state. So this has all been clear cut and this is still forested. And then strip cutting, which is a variation of clear cutting, but it's more sustainable and it doesn't have as much widespread destruction as clear cutting. So you take a strip of trees and you clear cut that strip. So here is the strip that was clear cut. And then you have regeneration within a few years. You don't completely destroy the entire forest ecosystem. And you are also controlling the soil erosion because the stream down here is clear, the water. Then we will talk about forest fires. So forest fires can start by lightning, a campfire that was not put out properly, electric lines that fall during storms or strong winds. For example, you have Santa Ana winds in California that are very strong winds and they could pick up a little spark that might happen from electric lines or lightning or the campfire, for example, and really pretty quickly spread a fire and it could become a widespread wildfire. And there are two types of forest fires. You have surface fires and crown fires. Surface fires usually burn only the undergrowth and the leaf litter on the forest floor. So seedlings and little trees are going to be affected the most but then the more mature trees, the larger trees are usually spared and most wild animals are able to escape. And the, flamm the flammable material on the ground burns away and that helps prevent more destructive wildfires in the future. Also, these surface fires free up the valuable nutrients that are in the decomposing plant material on the forest floor and then allow those nutrients to go back into the soil. Seeds are released from a particular type of pine tree called the lodgepole pine, where those seeds are released during forest fires. And also the stimulation of germination of certain tree seeds like the giant sequoia and the jack pine. So some trees have actually adapted to living in areas where they have forest fires. Also these surface fires can help control tree diseases and insects. And this is what the lodgepole pine looks like, the jack pine, and the giant sequoia. And some fires are intentional and beneficial to the forest ecosystem. And we call these prescribed fires. So scientists will actually purposely burn parts of a forest to mimic what could happen naturally during a surface fire. And this helps the health of a forest by clearing out some of the old dead wood and it keeps parts of the forest less dense with trees and it can lessen the risk of having a larger forest fire in the future. And then crown fires are extremely hot fires and they leap from treetop to treetop. They burn entire mature trees. Crown fires can destroy most of the vegetation in a forest and kill a lot of wildlife. And then after the, the vegetation is cleared by the fire, you have an increased risk of soil erosion 
if it rains and that might lead to landslides. And crown fires may burn or damage human structures that might be in their paths. And then we have a little bit about the bushfires in Australia. And they started in 2019 towards the, the mid to end of 2019. And by the 14th of January, the year 2020, fires during the warm season in Australia had burnt about 46 million acres, destroyed over 5,900 buildings and killed at least 34 people. It's estimated that approximately 1 billion animals were killed in the bushfires and the air quality was at hazardous levels. And then an example in the United States of a really large fire, wildfire is the Camp Fire in California in November 2018. This was the deadliest, most destructive fire in California history at this point of, 29th, of 2018. And here is an overhead view. And here it shows you where the fire was. And it was named after Camp Creek Road. And it resulted from a faulty power line that was then exacerbated by drought and winds. And that really carried the fire pretty extensively, pretty quickly. And it was a massive, very destructive fire. Then we will talk about deforestation. Deforestation is the removal of large areas of a forest to use that land for agriculture, settlements, and ranching. For example, parts of the Amazon rainforest are burned in order to make room for ranching and soybean farms. And that comes from a film called The State of the Planet's Wildlife that we will watch in lab. And a lot of the soybeans grown in these farms are then exported and used as food for livestock animals in Asia, particularly China. Humans have caused the loss of almost half of the world's original forest cover. Most of this loss has occurred during the last 60 years. And this is a more current picture of deforestation in the Amazon rainforest. And that again is in order to make soybean farms. Here is another image of deforestation. A lot of this is area where they burn the trees, they burn the forest, and that's a way of just getting rid of everything. You still do have these remnants of the burned trees that have to be cleared, but that is, in most cases, how they clear the land to use it for farming. And here it says, Brazil's Space Research Agency data showed deforestation soaring 29.5% and a half percent to 9,762 square kilometers for the 12 months through July 2019. And this shows you the tree loss 
in the Amazon rainforest between 2001 and 2019. And it's divided by country and then the different colors show the year. So you can see Brazil has a lot more tree loss than any of the other countries. And then if you remove Brazil from the chart, then you would see Bolivia, Colombia, and Peru. So on this slide right here, they removed Brazil, and then you could see the scale is very different compared to the scale for Brazil. So that's why when you see Brazil in this bar graph, it looks like all the other countries have such small amounts. So it's harder to compare the other countries with each other. So when you remove Brazil, you change the vertical scale here. And now we're able to see that Bolivia in 2019 had a significant amount of tree loss. And then Peru is next, and then Colombia. But Brazil is a lot more tree loss than the other countries. And this shows you some har harmful effects of deforestation. You lose fertility from the soil because you wash a lot of nutrients down into local streams and waterways. That's from soil erosion when it rains. And then you're adding soil to aquatic systems like the rivers and lakes, and that affects the animals that live in the water and the plants, all the different organisms that live in the aquatic systems. You may have extinction of species that live in those forests, regional climate change, release of CO2 in the atmosphere through the process of burning the trees, when you burn the trees, you're releasing CO2 that used to be stored in the biomass of the trees. And then you're also not able to absorb CO2 in the future because you don't have those trees there any longer. And tropical forests are disappearing rapidly. So tropical forests cover about 6% of the land on Earth. They have at least half of the world's known species of land plants and animals living in tropical forests. So these are biodiversity hotspots. At the current rate of global deforestation, 50% of the world's remaining old growth tropical forests might be gone or severely degraded by the end of this century. There were different causes of tropical deforestation. So population growth and poverty, where people might be clearing areas of forests so they could engage in farming and ha they harvest the wood for fuel. For example, in parts of Africa, you might have people cutting down parts of the jungle forests in order to use the area for farming and for the wood. Government subsidies may encourage logging, ranching, and creation of plantations for crops. Tropical forests in South America are cleared and burned, again, for cattle grazing and for soybean plantations. And in Southeast Asia, tropical forests are being replaced with plantations of oil palm. And palm oil is used in cooking, in cosmetics, and biodiesel fuel. 
And if you were to look at products around your home, and if you were to look at the nutrition and ingredients of snacks that you might have, you may notice palm oil is an ingredient in a lot of things. And this is a diagram from the textbook that talks about causes of destruction and degradation of tropical forests. So here is a little farm, cattle ranching, tree plantations, fires to clear more land. Here is logging. And then we have ways that we could grow and harvest trees more sustainably. So we can identify and protect forest areas that are high in biodiversity, rely more on selective cutting and strip cutting as opposed to clear cutting. We can stop logging in old growth forests. We can reduce the building of roads in uncut forest areas. We can leave most standing dead trees and fallen timber for wildlife habitats and nutrient cycling. Put tree plantations only on previously deforested or degraded land so that you're not destroying any more forests in order to put tree plantations. Again, the issue with tree plantations is mainly because you're losing the biodiversity that you had with the original forest. Also, you can certify timber as being grown by sustainable methods. And we could include ecological services of forests in estimating the economic value of a forest. So some wood or the lumber is given a certification that shows it was grown and harvested in sustainable ways. So this can help consumers to make better choices because it says from well-managed forests, this is an example. So they stamp the side of the timber. So as consumers, we do have some choices We can also reduce inefficient use of construction materials, excess packaging, overuse of junk mail, inadequate paper recycling, and there's a whole lot more that can be done. Maybe not one person, but maybe people could get their towns to do better recycling, for example, or maybe you could write to companies that send a lot of excess packaging if you order something and let them, you know, maybe ask them or just let them know that you thought that they used a lot more packaging than was necessary, for example. Also, paper can be made from fiber that does not come from trees. For example, this plant called kanaf, it's a rapidly growing woody annual plant. This is what it looks like. And it can be harvested and used for paper so that you don't have to keep cutting down trees. And consumers can reduce the demand for products supplied through illegal and unsustainable logging in tropical forests. For building projects, people can use recycled waste lumber or wood alternatives such as recycled plastic and bamboo. So I've seen park benches and I've seen decks, like someone has a deck in their backyard. I've seen them made with plastic composites or some sort of wood composite that is not just 100% wood. It might be recycled material, but 
there are definitely alternatives to using wood and continuing to cut down trees. And bamboo grows pretty quickly, so that can be used for a lot of products. I've seen kitchen utensils made of bamboo. I've heard of flooring. Instead of a hardwood floor, you can use bamboo. Also, reduce the use of throwaway paper products and replace them with reusable plates, cups, and cloth napkins, for example. And how has deforestation been reversed in the United States? So here in the year 1620, the green is all the forested areas. And then this is 1920. Most of the forested areas have been degraded. And then here in the year 2000, a lot of the forested area has been regenerated, and that is through secondary succession. So a great deal of the area is regenerating. Rangelands are unfenced grasslands that are in temperate and tropical climates. They supply vegetation, which we call forage, for grazing, which are grass-eating animals, and browsing, which are animals that eat shrubs. Livestock also graze in pastures, which are managed grasslands or enclosed meadows. Usually those are planted with domesticated grasses or other forage. Some rangelands are overgrazed. Overgrazing occurs when too many animals graze for too long and they exceed the carrying capacity of a rangeland area. And here we see left of the fence is overgrazed land and right of the fence is lightly grazed. We can manage rangelands more sustainably by controlling the number of grazing animals and the duration of their grazing in a given area so that the carrying capacity is not exceeded. One method is rotational grazing. That's where you confine cattle to one area by using a portable fence, and you do that for a short time, such as one or two days, and then the fencing is moved to another location. On the left, you see in the mid 1980s, cattle had degraded the vegetation and the soil on the stream bank along the San Pedro River in Arizona. And the restoration occurred through secondary ecological succession where within 10 years, the area was restored after grazing and off-road vehicle use was banned. Both of those were banned. Now you have these trees, these shrubs, you have a lot of plants, whereas before you had mainly just soil left because of overgrazing. Now we're gonna talk about national parks. There were many national parks located around the world in more than 120 countries. Parks in less developed countries have the greatest biodiversity, but only about 1% of these parks are protected. People might enter the parks to harvest firewood or go hunting. Miners and loggers might operate illegally in parks. Poachers might kill animals illegally. People also look for exotic plants to then sell as house plants, where they sell them online. Many parks suffer from the effects of invasive species, and also some parks are so popular that large numbers of visitors cause degradation of the natural habitat. 
So here is a case study about stresses on public parks in the U.S. The U.S. National Park System was established in 1912 and includes 59 major national parks, along with 339 monuments and historic sites. There were also state, county, and city parks. Popularity of parks is one of the biggest problems. Noisy and polluting vehicles degrade the aesthetic experience for many visitors, destroy or damage fragile vegetation, and disturb wildlife. Many parks suffer damage from the migration or deliberate introduction of non-native species. For example, the European wild boar that we discussed in chapter eight. Native species, some of them threatened or endangered, are killed or removed illegally. For example, the gray wolf in Yellowstone National Park. So we will focus now on the gray wolves situation in the Yellowstone National Park. Around the year 1800, there were approximately 350,000 gray wolves roaming over three quarters of America's lower 48 states, especially in the West. They preyed on bison, elk, caribou, and deer. Between 1850 and 1900, most wolves were trapped, shot, or poisoned by ranchers, hunters, and government employees. They were driven to near extinction in the lower 48 states. Ecologists realized the importance this keystone predator species once played. In Yellowstone National Park, the wolves helped control the populations of various other animals. Left uncontrolled, the elk, moose, and mule deer expanded and devastated the willow and aspen trees growing near rivers. This led to increased soil erosion and declining populations of other species. For example, beavers, which eat willow and aspen. Declining beaver populations affect species that rely on wetland areas that are created by beavers, which build dams. In 1995 and 1996, federal wildlife officials caught gray wolves in Canada and Northwest Montana in order to relocate them to Yellowstone National Park. The hope was to stabilize the ecosystem there. The reintroduction of wolves has led to the important benefits for the ecosystem in the park. Here is a video about the topic. One of the most exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that wolves kill various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years. That the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park. And despite efforts by humans to control them, they'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They'd just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. 
and immediately those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving in. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers um, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes. And as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed on it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. <laughs> and the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. But here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less erosion. The channels narrowed. More pools formed. More riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transformed not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. For the video that I just showed, if you want to watch it again at another time, these are two different links that bring you to that video. Protecting wilderness is an important way to preserve biodiversity. One way to protect undeveloped land is to set the area aside as wilderness. That's land officially designated as an area where natural communities have not been seriously disturbed by humans and where human activities are limited by law. The Wilderness Act of 1964 allowed the government to protect undeveloped areas of public land from development as part of the National Wilderness Preservation System. Only about 2% of the land area of the lower 48 states is protected, and most of it is in the West. We can rehabilitate and restore ecosystems that have been damaged. Almost every natural place on Earth has been affected or degraded to some degree by human activities. We can at least partially reverse much of this harm through ecological restoration. That's the process of repairing damage caused by humans to the biodiversity and dynamics of natural ecosystems. There are four steps to speed up reparations to disturbed or destroyed ecosystems. Restoration, rehabilitation, replacement, and creating artificial ecosystems. We'll start with restoration. That's returning degraded habitats and ecosystems as close as possible to their natural state. Examples of restoration of ecosystems include replanting forests, restoring wetlands, reintroducing native species and removing invasive species, and removing man-made dams to allow rivers to flow their natural course. Then rehabilitation. 
that is turning a degraded ecosystem into a functional ecosystem without trying to restore its original condition. So for example, removing pollutants from an abandoned mine or industrial sites. And we have replacement. Replacing a degraded ecosystem with another type of ecosystem. For example, a degraded forest can re be replaced by a pasture or a tree plantation. And creating artificial ecosystems. For example, reef balls. These are cement balls that are used to restore reef systems because it provides something strong for organisms to live on on the sea floor. So it helps to build up reefs when, for example, a lot of coral might die. The reef balls help to build up the substrate of the seafloor. We can also share areas that we dominate with other species. And this is reconciliation ecology. This focuses on coming up with new habitats to conserve biodiversity in places where people live and work. Examples include protecting vital pollinators, for example, native butterflies and bees, by reducing pesticide use, planting wildflowers as a food source, building structures pollinating bees can use as a hive, and building nesting boxes for birds, for example, bluebirds. And that provides a spot where they can nest safely in areas where most of the trees have been cut down. Also, you can build bat boxes for the same reason. And here are some photos of a field where native plants were planted and it's left alone with wildflowers and grasses and you can have a lot of insects in here and pollinators and it's also supposed to serve as a natural water filter so the rain that falls on this field here is able to sink back down into the groundwater instead of acting as runoff not sinking into blacktop and the sidewalks. This is in Bayside, Queens, and there's a major highway right behind this field. So this is restoring a little bit of nature in an urban environment. And then these are some pictures. This is a bluebird nest in a nesting box and a bat box. So if humans cut down a lot of trees in an area, the animals that normally live in the trees are going to need somewhere to live. So you can build boxes for them to live in. And these are some different ways we could help sustain terrestrial biodiversity. We can plant trees, recycle paper, for example, choose wood substitutes, landscape your yard with a diversity of plants native to your area. Now we're gonna talk about aquatic ecosystems. Human activities have been destroying and degrading aquatic biodiversity. In freshwater aquatic zones, the building of dams and excessive water withdrawal from rivers for irrigation and urban water supplies can destroy and disrupt aquatic habitats. Also, the introduction of invasive species threatens aquatic bi biodiversity as well. 
34% of the world's known marine fish species and 71% of the world's freshwater fish species face extinction. Sea bottom habitats have been destroyed due to dredging, which is when you remove sediment from the seafloor to make the seafloor deeper so you can get larger boats in, let's say, a harbor, or you dredge in a river, for example, to make the river deeper, and then it helps prevent flooding. Or tra trawler fishing boats, which take nets that are huge, and they drag the net along the seafloor, and they catch, it's a way of catching a whole lot of organisms that live on the seafloor. But those are both destructive to the seafloor. Overfishing is a huge problem, and we have what's called fisheries. A fishery is a concentration of a particular wild aquatic species that is suitable for commercial harvesting in a given ocean area or inland body of water. Some fisheries have been overfishing certain species. The fish print is defined as the area of ocean needed to sustain the consumption of an average person, a nation, or the world. Overharvesting has led to the collapse of some of the world's major fisheries. 52% of the world's fisheries are fully exploited, 20% are considered as moderately exploited, overexploited, and 28% are overexploited or depleted. We're going to take a closer look at the Atlantic cod. So the Northwest Atlantic fishery abruptly collapsed in 1992 following overfishing that started in the 1950s, the late 1950s. So this graph shows the fish landings in tons. That's the amount of fish that are caught. And it kind of goes up and down, up and down, but it stays mostly below 300,000, well below 300,000 for, for a lot of this time period. And then when you get to the late 1950s, all of a sudden it jumps. See this really big jump here to 800,000 tons of fish. And then you basically collapse the population, drops all the way down here. So they were not fishing as many cod, or not catching as many cod. And then all the way down here is 1992, is basically a collapse of the cod fishery. And that's due to overfishing that happened in the late 1950s, right? So you have this huge increase in the amounts of cod that were caught, and then that leads to a collapse. And then this very distinct collapse in 1992. And then here is another video. We begin our story in a small town near the crossroads of the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. They call Aveiro the Venice of Portugal.
visitors flock here because of the picturesque location. A, a series of canals and bridges set against classical architecture dating back to the 16th century. But for those who call Avero home, for those who treasure its traditional way of life, they know that it is famous for more than its quaint buildings and scenic canals. 400 years ago, this was where the world's largest long distance fishing fleet set sail for North America. Though aided by the navigational skills developed by early explorers, the crossing was never easy. especially when the fleet reached the treacherous waters of the North Atlantic. But when the boats finally arrived at the fishing grounds off Newfoundland and New England, what they found was the richest cod fishery in the world. Each morning, the fishermen set out in one-man dories. For the next 10 hours, they hand-lined for cod. Just before sundown, the dorymen returned to the mothership to unload the day's catch, and then spend many more hours cleaning and salting the cod. Though the work was hard, this was a proud way of life that helped feed the world for centuries. As word spread about the size of the fishery, fleets from all over the world joined the hunt. Every year, the size of the fleet got bigger, and every year, the size of the catch increased. Towards the end of the 20th century, over three billion pounds of Atlantic cod were pulled each year from the fertile waters of the North Atlantic. What happened next was unimaginable. Nets started coming up empty. It turns out that the fleet was catching cod faster than they could reproduce. And by the end of the 20th century, one of the largest fisheries in the world collapsed. It's human nature to kind of overdo a good thing and fisheries have done that repeatedly. The, the history of fisheries is pretty much boom and bust. You find one thing, you drive it down, deplete it, then find some new thing, drive it down, deplete it. Can you imagine, after feeding the world for hundreds of years, we showed our gratitude by nearly wiping cod off the face of the earth. Today, the species is on the verge of extinction. And for the fishermen of Avero, the consequences have been devastating. Here, along the city's commercial waterfront, nearly 80% of Portugal's long-distance trawlers rust away in watery graves. When the cod fishery collapsed, Aveiro's economy also collapsed. Protecting marine biodiversity is difficult for several reasons. The human ecological footprint and fish, fish print are expanding so rapidly into aquatic areas that it is difficult to monitor the impacts. Much of the damage to the oceans and other bodies of water is not visible to most people. Many people incorrectly view the seas as an inexhaustible resource that can absorb an almost infinite amount of waste and pollution and still produce all the seafood that we want. Most of the world's ocean area lies outside the legal jurisdiction of any country and is thus an open access resource and subject to overexploitation. Then I want to go over a case study about restoring the oyster beds of the Delaware River and the Delaware Bay. 
And if we look at this map here, it is between New Jersey and Delaware. So there was a project, a restoration project, where it was designed to increase the amount of oysters in these waterways. So here's the purpose, to compensate for the loss of the bottom habitat in the Delaware estuary as a result of the Athos oil spill. A three-year oyster reef restoration pro program was funded. Now, oysters play an important role in the bay's ecosystem, and that is because they provide a habitat for a lot of different organisms. It's similar to a coral reef. So the oyster reefs have a hard substrate on the seafloor. And these other organisms use the oyster reefs for spawning, foraging, and nursing. So this project had the purpose of increasing the population of oysters by putting oyster larvae in different areas of the bay. And then sometimes after the oysters get a little bit larger, they relocate them to other parts of the local waterways. And this is important also because oysters are very good at cleaning the water. So oysters will help maintain a clean ecosystem in an estuary. So the beginning of the project was to drop a lot of shells, mollusk shells, into parts of the Delaware Bay. And then that allows an area for the oyster larvae to settle so that they have sort of this reef that they could start growing. And then later on, some of them were transported to areas further up bay. And that brings us to the end of chapter nine. If you wanna read more about the oyster bed restoration, you can look at these two links. There's more information there. Okay, so that is the end of chapter nine. Thank you for listening.